dear president, uh, academicians, guests. First of all, I am I'm, I'm really grateful to Jaak and um, Ulo organizing this event, and of course inviting me also to this uh, uh, very important event. So I, uh, I heard about Victor first time actually from my mother, who was a gastroenterologist. And then I realized that there is a man whose name is Muit, and then I realized that he's Estonian, and that he has discovered a bunch of, of peptides. Then I met him actually in 1988, uh, when my dear friend Håkon Persson invited me to give a lecture at Karolinska. And Håkon, as a civilized gentleman, had invited also Victor to that uh, lecture. So that was my first meeting with Victor. Uh, I spent then two days uh, with Victor, and uh, Victor invited me also to his home, where I actually met Michael Muit, who will speak later today. So, um, uh, we today really uh, honor, uh, I think, the greatest Estonian born biochemist. Uh, and uh, he was a giant who discovered a number of gastrointestinal peptides. And I think um, he moved gut endocrinology uh, to a level of, of brain research. And now when we know that, uh, uh, what is the impact of the gastrointestinal microflora, I think all his discoveries have an extra impact. Um, I'm not original showing uh, uh, what he has discovered. He has discovered a, a, a really a great number of uh, uh, brain and gastrointestinal uh, peptides, which um, along when we understand how the enteric nervous system works, and we know that it actually works uh, largely different uh, from uh, the rest of the peripheral nervous system, it, it functions more or less as a brain. And Mike Gershon, one of the uh, big uh, uh, names in uh, gastrointestinal uh, neuroscience, calls it the second brain of a man. So I will today a little bit introduce you to the second brain of the man, and also then focus a little bit on the early development of the enteric nervous system and also to some of the pathologies related to that. that uh, so I will eventually touch ground with my, my, my own re research. So, uh, well, just to remind you that neurons uh, are uh, cells which receive, store and tr transmit information and they do that mostly at the, at the synopsis. But what is probably not so well known is that uh, our brain has 10 in the power of 11 neurons, which is actually equal to the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And these 10 in the power of 11 neurons make 10 in the power of 14 contacts. Well, uh, we now almost every day hear about the uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And I must admit that most of the guys who talk about artificial intelligence and tell that they develop artificial intelligence on the basis of the, how brain works, I'm always getting surprised because I, I, I don't know how brain works. How can you design AI based on what uh, we don't know how it works? So, uh, Remember, we have 10 in the power of 14 contacts, which is more than 100 times more than stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And now comes the most important part. In the, in the computer, these contacts are fixed, but in the brain, all these are changing. And actually, these changing uh, the synaptic contacts in the brain is actually the basis of memory and learning. Without that, we, we can't memorize, we can't learn. 
And of course, uh, neuropeptides are doing a very, very important role in that. As already uh, uh, Thomas in his uh, plenary lecture mentioned, uh, neurons are exciting because they have very long axons. And uh, you have, have to transport sometimes things uh, one meter. Some of the motor axons are really almost one meter long. So you have to drag energy there, you have to drag mitochondria there, but you don't drag most of the proteins because nature has decided to do it so that it has put ribosomes in axons and dendrites and you transport messenger RNA, which Erin Schumann now more and more has actually demonstrated. All this makes brain uh, very energy consuming. Also, our brain is only uh, 1.3 to 1.5 kilo. It consumes 20% uh, of our energy. So Estonian saying Pia on Kum is actually totally scientifically justified. So it is really hot, the head. So an enteric nervous system, as I said, uh, is a second uh, brain of the man. It functions very independently. Uh, it is uh, regulating gut motility. It doesn't need any input from the brain. It does it absolutely independently. And it forms also circles. And like also the brain, it is extremely important that it has uh, almost 100 times less neurons, but makes perhaps even more contacts than, uh, uh, than the brain neurons make. So, uh, uh, in contrast to other peripheral neurons, although we now, using this single neuron sequencing, also learn more and more, but I think enteric nervous system is also interesting because it contains a great number of different types of neurons. We think in the brain we have at least 1,000 dif types different neurons. In the enteric nervous system, I think we have perhaps 20 or even more types of neurons. I'm not going into the anato anatomy of that, but uh, they are mostly um, located in two different plexus, the myoenteric plexus and in the submucosal plexus. So, uh, uh, another very interesting uh, property of the enteric nervous system is that it, like our brain, virtually lacks connective tissue. It is consisting mostly of neurons, glial cells, and then uh, our brain also microglia, which we can consider as immune cells. And if in our brain, according to the best knowledge, uh, glia and neurons are 50-50, then in the gut still uh, glial cells are the majority. So, uh, I'm now, the uh, rest of my talk uh, discuss about the development of the enteric nervous system. So, uh, the, uh, the whole peripheral nervous system, including enteric nervous system, uh, comes from the uh, neural crest in Estonian uh, neural hurry. And there is a special population of stem cells in the neural crest which give rise to the entire enteric nervous system. So if you look at the mouse, then in the embryonic day number nine, these crest cells start to migrate and rather rapidly in almost two days they colonize the whole gastrointestinal tract. So the migration is extremely important for these cells. They, as you understand, migrate long distances and they are not neurons. When they, uh, when they travel they still proliferate and then when they finally come to the right place they stop dividing and differentiate into the neurons. So, 
actually, until the mid-90s, it was virtually nothing known what regulates the migration, survival, and maintenance of enteric nervous. Uh, oh, well, there are well, some indications that uh, growth factors regulate de development, but I think in uh, the, the very important uh, uh, discovery was made in 1996, my lab included, at that time also one lab in Genentech and uh, one, one, one lab in Harvard, when we did the uh, knockout of a growth factor called GDNF. GDNF was known as, as a factor which acts on dopamine neurons. We were making the knockout and of course we were thinking that, ooh, there will be a phenotype in the, in, in the brain. No, we were more than surprised to see that these mice almost completely lacked the whole enteric nervous system. Then, a few years later, we, and also two other labs, discovered that GDNF unexpectedly signals to the receptor tyrosine kinase RET. And then we realized that Vasilis Pachnis, who had published the RET knockout paper back in 1994, had exactly the same phenotype. Like lack of enteric neurons in the whole gastrointestinal tract below stomach. So, we discovered clearly one factor and signaling system which plays a crucial role in the migration and later a lot of studies showing also that not only the migration but also later for the maintenance and survival and functioning of these neurons. So, what is GDNF? GDNF is a protein we call neurotrophic factor. These are uh, factors which uh, uh, regulate uh, the development and survival uh, of, the, uh, of the neurons. And uh, as we know, neurons, when they are born, they start to send their axons to the target, then they form synapses. And actually, in, during the development, especially during the peripheral nervous system development, the neurons overproduced. And about 50% of the neurons which are initially born, are removed. So what, uh, what happens is that those neurons which reach the target and get the trophic support, uh, they will stay, whereas 50% of the neurons uh, will, will die. So like um, the ABBA, the winner takes it all. So uh, uh, Victor Hamburger, uh, the outstanding uh, neuroscientist working uh, at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, actually was the first to propose the so-called target field on neurotrophic theory. And then Hans Turner and Eve Bard, the guys who discovered brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, developed that theory to the end. So neurotrophic factors keep neurons alive, stimulate neurot outgrowth, and, uh, and for that, uh, Stanley Cohen and Rita Levantacini got the Nobel Prize for um, uh, Physiology or Medicine in 1986. I put here Victor Hamburg also picture because he actually predicted the existence of these factors. And when I um, uh, lecture to the students, then I uh, say that please look carefully on the picture. And if you carefully look at the picture, then you notice that Stanley Cohen uh, died when he was 99, Rita when she was 104, and Victor Hamburger when he was 102. So uh, if you select the subject of research, study neurotrophic factors, the end result is good. And I sometimes say that I don't look so bad either. <laughs> that is on your personal responsibility. So, so as I said, GDNF and the receptors um, uh, regulate the development of the enteric nervous system and, and actually have also impact to the pediatric disease called Hirschsprung disease. So, uh, so GDNF uh, is a member of the, of the family, we call it 
uh, nowadays GDNF family. I don't go into the details of that. GDNF is also now very greatly considered as a potential drug for the Parkinson's disease. Uh, so what they, how they work is that uh, they first bind to the core receptor, then recruit the transmembrane receptor tyrosine kinase. This gets activated, which means phosphorylated. That then triggers activation of the phosphorylation of MAP kinase, SARC kinase, and AKT kinase. And that causes a fast response in the cells, but then eventually transcription factors will be activated. So the response of the growth factor is actually long lasting. So, um, Talking about Hirschsprung disease, uh, the, you, you can see on the, on the right, uh, in that disease, which is a childhood disease, uh, it's a defect of the migration of the enteric neurons. So they do not migrate until the end of the gastrointestinal tract, so that the rectal area remains aganglionic, and as a result, the uh, the stools cannot move, and of course uh, the patient will uh, collect a, a lot of gas. Uh, as, a, as a light joke, it turns out that uh, quite a number of world-class swimmers have uh, an easier form of uh, Hirschsprung disease, which of course gives you more gases in the gastrointestinal tract, and you float better on the water. So it's not a joke, it's, uh, it's actually a fact. So uh, the uh, Hirschsprung disease is uh, uh, largely familial, where from the familial form, 50% of the cases carry red mutation, about 25% carry endothelin 3 or its receptor mutation, and about 10, 20%, the transcription factor 6, SOX10. There are also many more genes like GDNF, GDNF core receptor, GF alpha 1 and 2, but these are uh, uh, minor, uh, minor players in the game. So in, in Hirschsprung, which are currently quite effectively treated by surgery, uh, still the argonglionic state of the distal end of the Ganglion remains. And that, of course, is a great hope. Perhaps we can regenerate some of the uh, enteric neurons in the Hirschsprung patients, which then, when combined with a surgery, could actually work. And indeed, uh, endothelin 3 and GDNF jointly uh, act also in the sporadic forms of the of the uh, uh, Hirschsprung disease. So uh, when you look at the mutations in red, then uh, you see that um, uh, the red has uh, like three, three domains. On the left is a ligand binding domain, which is the extracellular. Then the TM is a transmembrane. And then inside the cell cytoplasmic is a tyrosine kinase, which is a so-called business end of the, of the receptor. And most of the, uh, in most of the receptors, the mutations are in the business end. But here, it's all scattered along the uh, molecule. So for many, many years, it was unclear how mutations in the ligand binding domain could do the um, uh, business. And it then turned out that it actually, uh, the, the reason is that it's not exocytosed anymore normally. So the, amount of red receptor on the cell surface will be reduced. So as I mentioned, uh, we, 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 we showed back in 1996 that uh, GDNF knockouts and then uh, Vasilis Pahnis has shown that for red, uh, lack kidneys, which is on the right, and then they completely lack the enteric nervous system. We then started to look at different uh, red uh, mutations using uh, mouse genetics. So uh, this is a picture with a red knockout. The enteric neuroblasts stay in the starting point. They don't colonize the gut. In the, uh, in the normal, 
the whole uh, gastrointestinal tract is colonized. And I, I have to mention here that there are two major isoforms of RET. They differ by 43 amino acids at the C terminal. One form has uh, just 43 amino acids more. So we then need the uh, specific knockout of both isoforms. And then we realize that when we uh, have the 51 alone, then we actually replicate the Hirschsprung disease. We have otherwise the normal, so which told us that actually something in the fifth, uh, in, in, in these last amino acids are important. So these are the different, uh, different genetic models we used. And then, of course, we started to, uh, started to think, can we, uh, what can we do for the therapy? So in collaboration with the Nicolas Spillon group in Canada, we used three different mouse models of Hirschsprung disease, and then put the recombinant GDNF protein into a foam and inserted that into the gastrointestinal tract. And below you see that in the case of GDNF, actually, we very significantly rescued the lifespan of, of the mice in all three Hirschsprung models. We then uh, wanted to know what happens. We were first thinking that we are rescuing mostly the generating uh, nearby existing uh, enteric neurons. But in a more closer analysis, we realized that actually GDNF mostly induces the birth of new neurons. And what was most surprising, that uh, it, uh, it induced a transdifferentiation so that most of the neurons which were born were born from glia. So I am now actively investigating that to understand what is the process. And this is also a new property of GDNF, what we never uh, knew before. So but at the end, of course, uh, I, I should say that uh, uh, GDNF or any other gross factor protein is not ideal for the therapy. It has uh, many, many limitations. The proteins and GDNF in particular, they diffuse very poorly in the tissues. They are expensive to produce, store, transport. And if you deal with neurological diseases, then you have the problem what Ulo tries to solve the blood-brain barrier penetration. So we were definitely looking for small molecules which could mimic the action of, um, uh, of, uh, of GDNF. And this is a collaboration with a company called GeneCode and with my old good friend, Matti Karelson, uh, one of the best chemists in this country. So our starting point was when we solved the crystal structure of GDNF and, and its score receptor GFR alpha one and realized that confirming the, the model by site-directed mutagenesis that actually the key interactions between the ligand and the receptors are in a very narrow area. And that was an intellectual stimulus to go and hunt for small molecules. So we have been now able to find molecules which uh, we hope uh, next year enter clinic. Uh, we have shown they work actually in stem cell derived uh, dopamine neurons and we hope we can use them also to treat Hirschsprung disease. So I will finish by thanking my current and, and former, current on the left side and former who contributed to this, uh, mostly to the genetic work on GDNF and GDNF receptors. And I thank you for the attention. Thank you. I was in time. No, very precise. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, questions, please. Yeah. 
I, I know that they have tried to get small uh, agonies for NGF for a very long time. Is what is this? Is there progress in that field? I, I, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think uh, the, the big pharma uh, already in early early 90s tried to get uh, using high throughput screening uh, the small molecule uh, uh, agonists to many growth factors, but they usually failed. And I, I think one of the reasons was that the quality of the libraries at, uh, in early 90s were not very good. We are currently using uh, really high quality libraries where the vast majority of the compounds are soluble, are not toxic, etc. So we, we have now GDNF mimetics which bind to GDNF receptor with the affinity of 10 nanomoles having half-life of six, six hours, very efficiently penetrating blood-brain barrier, having uh, very nice uh, uh, PI, PK uh, profile, uh, no, no activation of HERG, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a question of time now. They are coming. So, more? Uh, a, a picture. Can you, oh, the, the photo? Yes. Oh. Uh, uh, ah, uh, the, you, you missed the Estonian uh, greetings, or, or you, you want me to explain the. Yeah, well, this, this first of all, uh, the photo is made by my, my daughter who is a nature photographer. And uh, um, my message is that uh, is a question, uh, did we found the crystal ball? Uh, but, <laughs> but this is actually a piece of ice in the, in the evening light. I, I like the picture. So, some more? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a, s a small question, maybe a little bit outside of your um, research field, uh, regarding insulin-like uh, growth factors. There is a whole family of these. They look like insulin. Insulin is a tyrosine kinase receptor related and uh, several other uh, have different receptors like G protein couple receptor. Do you happen to know anything about these um, uh, kinds of molecules in yeah, they are uh, like yeah. growth factors, so to yeah. say. Well, uh, there, is, there are two of them, uh, insulin like growth factor one and two. And uh, they both uh, uh, have their own receptor, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase. They are actually both implicated uh, uh, quite a bit uh, in the regulation of the, uh, uh, of the nervous system, especially, I think, in the, in the uh, cortical neurons. And uh, insulin-like growth factor number two is or its activation is the main reason why our countryman Verpalo used uh, growth hormone. Because growth hormone has no effect on, on any physical, unless you want to uh, grow your muscles, but why, why a skier should grow his muscles. So he uses that because growth factor, growth, human growth hormone very robustly activates the synthesis and release of insulin-like growth factor. Insulin-like growth factor uh, for en uh, enhances the physical recovery. So, but we may have a guy who knows better than me about these molecules. We happen to isolate one of the these molecules from the porcelain brain in early 2000. Uh, it 
was called uh, relaxing. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. But it's a G protein coupled uh, ah, receptor okay, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the one and two are uh, through the tyrosine kinases. It is indeed the, the, a, a fantastic step to produce a small molecular uh, agonists to this um, cross factor receptors. The, the big issue is that there is almost no guarantee for their promotion of malignancies. And that cannot be ever excluded under then in very large chronic studies of their use yeah. because we don't really know what's already uh, a primary tumor which may require very few and it was not only the quality of libraries it was the tremendous failure of making anything of of um, the finding of, of um, the heterodimers of insulin receptor and the IGF-1 receptor heterodimer, which almost all solid tumors were uh, carrying. 75% uh, of all human solid tumors so have them. In that and regard, this, is a, this is a, a terrible problem, which is in Elysian and their biology was not the quality. But I would like to say, make an, a very Estonian comment, if you permit me, on occasion of your, your sure. talk. I did not realize that you will talk about libraries. But probably everybody in this room knows. To me, it was a surprise that in Tartu, there is a collection of seeds and leaves and roots um, which is one of the largest in the world, but the large is not always the best. But since you spoke about libraries, we have to say that no matter how ingenious chemists we have, inspiration comes from natural molecules. Yes. And we also have to say that this library of seeds, much of them collected in the Tsar's Russia in Kamchatka has been the number two uh, target of first of the German occupiers of Tartu and then of the Soviet occupiers taking it back to Puschino. Yet that library of natural compounds is not being systematically um, examined by, by Estonian and other efforts, although there are so many rumors about it that five James Bond films could be made of them. <laughs> well, uh, I could add that many, many in this room, including myself, went in Soviet times to expedition in Kurili Islands to enrich the library. We were uh, collecting bamboo to extract uh, the, the uh, carbohydrates, which were believed to be extremely important uh, drugs, anti-cancer drugs, used in Japan for ages. Thank you.